Okay, so we are, I am continuing with more readings from the tale of Despero. And um, we are on chapter 31 now, A Song in the Dark. This was a little, I didn't get to watch the movie like you guys did, and I should have watched it. Um, I'm probably going to watch it after I get done with this book, or maybe maybe here next couple of days, and I'm probably going to say, ah, I messed up those names so bad, but um, it was a little confusing at first, but now as the story's going on, all the things, all the stories are starting to come together for me, so I hope it's the same for you guys. If it was a little confusing, things are starting, oh yeah, oh yeah, they talked about that in the beginning, um, so Hopefully, if they weren't making sense to you, they are now, and they probably were making sense to you, and Miss Ugaldi is just a little slow. <laughs> so we're going to start chapter 31, A Song in the Dark. So remember, they were talking about in the summer, that smell came up from um, the dungeons. So the terrible foul odor of the dungeon did not bother Mig. Perhaps that is because sometimes... When Uncle was giving her a good clout to the ear, he missed his mark and delivered a good clout to Mig's nose instead. Oh. This happened often enough that it interrupted the proper working of Mig's olfactory senses. That's all the smelling senses that you have in here. So getting hit a whole bunch, just like it messed up her ear and her hearing, it messed up her sense of smell. And so it was that the overwhelming stench of despair and hopelessness and evil was not at all discernible to her. And she went happily down the twisting and turning stairs. Gar, she shouted. It's dark, ain't it? Yes, it is, Mig, she answered herself. But if I was a princess, I would be so glittery light-like that there wouldn't be a place in the world that was dark to me. At this point, Miggery Sow broke into a little song that went something like this. I ain't the Princess P, but someday I will be the P. Ha, he, someday I will be. Midge, as you can imagine, wasn't much of a singer like me. More of a bellower, really. But in her little song, there was, to the rightly tuned ear, a certain kind of music. And as Mig went singing down the stairs of the dungeon, there appeared from the shadows a rat wrapped in a cloak of red and wearing a spool on his head. Yes, yes, whispered the rat, a lovely song, just the song I've been waiting to hear. And Russ Girl quietly fell in step beside Miggery Sow. At the bottom of the stairs, Mig shouted out into the darkness, Gore, it's me, Miggery Sow. So, most calls me Mig. Delivering your food, come and get it, Mr. Deep Downs. There was no response. The dungeon was quiet, but it was not quiet in a good way. It was quiet in an ominous way. It was quiet in the way of a small, frightening sound. There was a snail-like slither of water oozing down the walls, and from around the darkened corner there came the low moan of someone in pain. And then, too, there was the noise of the rats going about their business, their sharp nails hitting the stones of the dungeon and their long tails dragging behind them through the blood and muck. Reader, if you are standing in the dungeon, you would certainly hear all those disturbing and ominous sounds. If I were standing in the dungeon, I would hear those sounds. If we were standing together in the dungeon, we would hear these sounds and we would be very frightened. We could cling to each other in our fear. But what did Miggery sound hear? That's right. Absolutely nothing. So it's a good thing she couldn't hear for... Well, the first time probably was a good thing she couldn't hear and good thing she couldn't smell. And so she was not afraid at all, not in the least. 
She held the tray up higher and the candle shed its weak light on the towering pile of spoons and bowls and kettles. Gore, said Mig. Look at them things. I ever imagined there could be so many spoons in the whole wide world. There is more to this world than anyone could imagine, said a booming voice. Oh, let me read that again. There is more to this world than anyone could imagine, said a booming voice from the darkness. True, true, whispered Roscuro. The old jailer speaks the truth. Gore, said Mig, who's that? And she turned in the direction of the jailer's voice. Chapter 22, Beware of the Rats. The candlelight on Mig's tray revealed Gregory limping towards her, the thick rope tied around his ankle and his hands outstretched. You, Gregory, presumes, have brought food for the jailer. Gore, said Mig, and she took a step backwards. Give it here, said Gregory, and he took the tray from Mig and sat down on an overturned kettle that had rolled free from the tower. He balanced the tray on his knees and stared at the covered plate. Gregory assumes that today, again, there's no soup. Eh? said Mig. Soup! shouted Gregory. Illegal! shouted Mig back. Most foolish, muttered Gregory as he lifted the cover of the plate. Too foolish to be born a world without soup. He picked up a drumstick and put the whole of it in his mouth and chewed and swallowed. Here, said Mig, staring hard at him. You forgot the bones. Not forgotten. Chewed. Gregory ate another piece of chicken, a wing, bones, and all. And then another. Mig watched him admiringly. Some day, she said, moved. Some day, she said moved suddenly to tell this man her deepest wish. I will be a princess. At this pronouncement, Chiroscuro, who was still at Mig's side, did a small deliberate jig of joy. In the light of one candle, his dancing shadow was large and fearsome indeed. Gregory sees you, Gregory said to the rat shadow. Roscuro seized his dance. He moved to hide beneath Mig's skirt. Eh? shouted Mig. What's that? Nothing, said Gregory. So you aim to be a princess. Well, everyone has a foolish dream. Gregory, for instance, dreams of a world where soup is illegal. And that rat, Gregory, is sure, has some foolish dream, too. If only you knew, whispered Riss Girl. What? shouted Mig. Gregory said nothing more. Instead, he reached into his pocket and then held up his napkin up to his face, sneezed into it once, twice, <laughs> three times. Bless you, shouted Mig. Bless you, bless you. Back to the world of light, Gregory. Oh, back to the world of light, Gregory whispered, and then he balled the napkin up and placed it on the tray. Gregory is done he said, and he held the tray out to Mig. Done, are you? Then the tray goes back upstairs. Cook says it must. You take the tray to the deep downs, you wait for the old man to eat, and then you bring the tray back. Them's my instructions. Did they instruct you too to beware of the mice, of the rats? The what? The rats. What about them? Beware of them, shouted Gregory. Right, said Mig, beware of the rats. Roscuro, hidden beneath Mig's skirt, rubbed his front paws together. Warn her all ye like, old man, he whispered. My hour has arrived. The time is now and your rope must break. No nib nib nibbling this time. Rather a serious chew will break it in two. Yes, it is all coming clear. Revenge is at hand. Uh, let's see how long this next. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and read this last chapter because it is the end of book three. So next time I read, I will be starting the fourth book, The Call to the Light, book four. 
but I'm going to finish book three first. Chapter 33, A Rat Who Knows Her Name. Mig had climbed the dungeon stairs and was preparing to open the door to the kitchen when the rat spoke to her. May I detain you for a moment? Mig looked to her left, then to her right. Down here, said Ruth's girl. Mig looked at the floor. Gore, she said, but you're a rat, ain't you? And didn't the old man just warn me of such? Beware the rats, he said. She held the tray up higher so the light from the candle shone directly on Ruth's girl and the golden spoon on his head and the blood red cloak blood red cloak around his neck. There's no need to panic, none at all, said Rusgoro. As he talked, he reached behind his back, and using the handle, he raised the soup spoons off his head, much in the manner of a man lifting his hat to a lady. Gore, said Mick, a rat with manners. Yes, said Rusgoro, how do you do? My papa had him some clock much like yours, Mr. Rat, said Mig, red like that. He traded me for it. Ah, said Ruth's girl, and he smiled a large, knowing smile. Hey, did he really? That's a terrible story, a tragic story. Reader, if you will pardon me, we must pause for a moment to consider a great and unusual thing, a portentous thing. Portentous thing. That's a word I've never heard before. I'm going to have to look that up and put it in my dictionary. That great, unusual, portentous, I hope I'm saying it right, thing is this. Russ Girl's voice was pitchy, pitched perfectly to make its way through the torturous path of Mig's broken down cauliflower ears. That is to say, dear reader, Miggery Sow heard perfect and true every single word the rat rust girl uttered so sometimes when you lose your losing your hearing there are certain sounds that you can hear so they're saying rust girl's uh voice was just the right pitch that she could hear you have known your share of tragedy said rust girl to mig perhaps it is time for you to make the acquaintance of triumph and glory triumph said mig Glory. Allow me to introduce myself, said Rusguro. I am Chira Rusguro. Friends call me Rusguro. And your name is Miggery Sal. And it is true, is it not, that most people call you simply Mig? Ain't that the thing, shouted Mig, a rat who knows my name. Miss Miggery, my dear, I do not want to appear too forward so early in our acquaintance, but may I inquire, am I right in ascertaining that you have aspirations? So a rat who knows my name, so there's Mig, and there's her cauliflower ear. You can kind of see how it all has all those bumps. There she is talking to Russ Girl, and there he is, big snout. What do ye mean, aspirations? shouted Mig. Miss Miggery, there's no need to shout, none at all. As you can hear me, so can I hear you. So I can hear you. We are two perfectly suited, each to the other, Russ Girl smiled again, displaying a mouthful of sharp yellow teeth. Aspirations, my dear, are those things that would make a serving girl wish to be a princess. Gore, agreed Mig. A princess is exactly what I want to be. There is, my dear, a way to make that happen. I believe that there is a way to make that dream come true. You mean I could be the Princess P? Yes, your highness, said Russ Girl, and he swept the spoon off his head and bowed deeply at the waist. Yes, your most royal Princess P. Gore, said Mig. May I tell you my plan? May I illustrate for you how we can make your dream of becoming a princess a reality? Yes, said Mig. Yes. It begins, said Rusk Girl, with yours truly and the chewing of a rope. 
Meg held the, tr held the tray with one small candle burning bright, and she listened as the rat went on, speaking directly to the wish in her heart. So passionately did Risk Girl speak, and so intently did the serving girl listen that neither noticed as the napkin on the tray moved. Nor did they hear the small mouse-like noises of disbelief and outrage that issued from the napkin as Risk Girl went unfolding step by step this diabolical plan to bring the princess to darkness. Ooh, so it sounds like they want to kill the princess. <gasps> Who do you think is moving underneath that napkin? Hmm, you're going to have to wait and find out to see if you're right. So that's the end of the third book. End of the third book. And like I said, we'll be starting book four next time. Okay. So, yep, everything's becoming clearer now to me that uh, as I'm reading, all the stories are starting to come together. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am reading it to you. And have a wonderful day, evening, whenever you're, you're uh, listening to this. And I will see you next time. Love you.